Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Appleton. I'm the tech lead for the Maps API. Today, I'd like to talk about a couple of recent additions to the Maps API, um, particularly static maps, the ability to fetch a, a map image from a Google server, and street view, which we've added to the API only fairly recently. So the Static Maps API was released in February of this year. Um, essentially, it's a simple service whereby you ask Google for an image of a map, and we provide that to you on request. And you can uh, tailor that map by providing a particular viewport you want to see and other parameters they'll go into later. It has the distinct advantage that it goes where code can't. So certainly it's useful for mobile devices, for example. Um, many mobile devices can't run JavaScript or run only a subset of JavaScript. And so showing a static map can be a much better experience than trying to run a JavaScript page. And also, it has the advantage of being much faster to load because it is just an image rather than a bunch of JavaScript which then has to fetch um, our map tiles. Uh, we can also go on blogs and a few other sites where you can't have JavaScript. So it extends the reach of Google Maps, if you like, to be able to reach more users than you could normally. Um, but it becomes most interesting when mashed up with the, uh, when matching up the Static Maps API with the JavaScript API, then we can see how we'll get fast page loads by showing a static map image first and then loading the JavaScript later, and also um, adding the ability to print Maps API pages, uh, pages which use the Maps API, which turns out to be something that browsers aren't so good at. In the, sec in the latter half of my talk, I'll be talking about Street View. We added Street View to the Maps API in March this year, it was actually an intern project in Sydney, um, which, we fit, which we launched shortly after he left. Um, Street View originally launched on the Maps homepage, Google Maps homepage, last year with only about five cities at the time. But certainly we've been busy collecting a lot of data, and it's now in 40 cities in the US and perhaps coming to other countries soon. And the essential idea of uh, Street View and the Maps API is it lets you show the same panoramic imagery that we have on Google Maps in your own site. So let's start by looking at how to use the Static Maps API. Here we have a really simple web page, which is essentially just a wrapper around an image tag. And we set the source of that image to point to maps.google.com slash static map. So this is the Static Maps service. In the URL, in the CGI parameters, we provide the size of the image. Here it's 500 pixels wide by 250 pixels um, high. We provide the center and zoom level of the map, so we can specify the viewport we want to look at. And finally, we provide our Maps API key. And that's the same key we use for the, the standard JavaScript API. So there's no need to go signing up for new keys, for example. Now, this is much simpler than the corresponding JavaScript API code, where you have to first fetch um, the Maps API by script. And then, once the page is finished loading, then you know that all the symbols from the Maps API are available. So you can call, you can construct a new GMAP2 object and set the center to get the same map that we saw on the previous slide. So you can see, for example, the Statemaps API has the advantage of being quite simple by comparison to the JavaScript API. Now, Pamela Fox, who is our developer contact, wrote an awesome demo page, uh, a wizard, which lets you build up a static map API um, URL in a WYSIWYG interface. So here we have, at the bottom of the page, a static map image. And this is not draggable. At the top of the page, we have a JavaScript map, which we can, of course, drag and zoom. Whenever we update the map at the top of the page, we also update the source attribute of the image tag at the bottom of the page. So as you zoom and drag and so on, so does the static map. OK. So a few features of the Static Maps API which are particularly useful are, for one, the ability to add markers to the map. So here we geocode a marker, and we can drag it around on the JavaScript map, and that marker then appears on the static map at the base of the page. Whenever we drag the marker, we once again update the source attribute of that image tag. And all the while, we're also dumping at the base of the screen the URL for that map image. Um, in addition, we can also add polylines to the map, or paths, if you like. So here we're adding a simple polygon with three edges, and it renders as well in the static map. Um, for markers, you can see that the format is uh, a simple CGI parameter whose value equals the latitude and longitude, followed by the color of the marker. 
Now we can style markers um, in various ways. You can specify their size, for example. By default, we're using the normal size. But we can also specify that they should be mid-sized, for example, all the way down through small to tiny. So you can certainly imagine that if you have lots of data, maybe 100 markers to show on the map, you can do that. And then you can have one big marker, which is the important marker, for example. For mid-sized and for normal-sized markers, you can also specify a letter. So here we're showing the letter A through the letter F. Um, we do actually support up to Z, but this combo box only goes up to G. And you can finally specify the color of that marker as well. Likewise, for polylines, you can specify what color they should be. Let's make this one brown. You can play with the opacity. So this can be fully saturated or quite washed out, for example. So you can see the map through the polyline. And you can also modify the, uh, the weight, rather, which is simply the thickness of that polyline. So those are the main things, the main CGI parameters to know about for the Static Maps API. There's reference documentation if you're interested about some of, some of the more detailed aspects. I would like to show you two CGI parameters which aren't mentioned on this page. So if I simply steal this image location and open that up in a new tab, I can insert parameters by hand now. So for one, we can specify the format of our image. By default, we provide images in the GIF format. But we also support PNG, particularly, I should say, 32-bit PNG. Um, since GIF and PNG are both lossless formats, the two maps look identical, but there can be reasons why you want to have one or the other rendered, for example, on a mobile device. And we can also specify JPEG. Um, JPEG images are losslessly coded, so you'll see some small JPEG artifacts. But this is really handy for a low bandwidth connection. Um, some mobile devices can progressively decode JPEG, for example, so that if you do view a JPEG static map, you can see when the first few kilobytes of the image come in, you can see a fairly fuzzy looking map, and then details come in later on. So it's great for showing a map really quickly. The second CGI parameter I want to mention was the map type. So you can specify the type of the map tiles. By default, we show roadmap, which is the same tiles that we see in the Maps API, the JavaScript API. Uh, but we also support a tile set called mobile, which is opti optimized for mobile devices. So here we're showing a map which is much, uh, has much less detail because it's hard to see some details on a mobile screen. And we've also flattened the palette quite a bit. So we're seeing higher contrast. The text is now black rather than being gray, um, slightly larger, and we're dropping out many of the intermediate shades of color because it's harder to see those in sunlight on a mobile device. So um, now I'd like to walk through the development of a fairly simple um, demonstration application, which I'll use to show you how to mash up the Static Maps API with the JavaScript API. So for starters, here I have a page that is much like the slide showed previously, simply an image tag. Um, Offline, I've geocoded the positions of the Moscone Center, where we are now, and San Francisco Airport, and also computed driving directions from, from the center here to the airport. And I've shown these on a map. So we're simply showing two markers in a polyline, but these have been computed using the Maps API offline. So this is just an image tag, as you can see. Here I have the equivalent page as a JavaScript API map. You can see that loaded a fair bit slower. Firebug reports that this loaded in something like 500 milliseconds. So that includes the time required to load the map tiles. Um, and the, by comparison, the static map loaded in 200 milliseconds. So you can get much faster page loads, as I mentioned earlier, by using the static maps API. Now, certainly something that we notice at Google is that every time we speed up our site, we get a great many more page views. Um, not only do existing users use your site more, but more users come to your site and like it because it is quick and snappy and gives them the answers they want as fast as possible. So we really focus on making everything fast. What we'd like to do then is to get the speed that the Static Maps API has to load up a map in 200 milliseconds. Combine that with the JavaScript API's ability to, for example, have interactive maps. Because the Static Map isn't draggable. It's kind of depressing for users who are used to seeing that map and dragging it around. Whereas the JavaScript map, of course, is you can interact with it you can dynamically add content to that map. You can listen for user events. It's much more powerful. We want to hybridize these to get something that is better than both of them. So 
I'll show you the code for this page in a moment, but here's, here's the, the basic idea. What we want to do is we want to place two, two map images on the same page. The first image, the first map I mean to say, is an image tag which points to the Static Maps API. So this is going to load up the, our first view of the page, if you like. Then after that image loads, then we'll load the JavaScript API and we'll load up the tiles and the markers and the shadows and so on, and we'll switch over to display those instead. So if you watch closely as my mouse mouses over the image tag, as soon as the user first tries to interact with that map, we're going to remove the static map image and switch over to the interactive JavaScript map. So you'll see a small jump. The marker shifted slightly, the logo shifted slightly. It's just barely perceptible, but it's enough that um, yeah, users generally won't notice it, I think. Um, so now you can see, of course, we can drag this map around. But we had the benefit of showing a map when the page first loaded really, really quickly. Um, another thing that, uh, another problem, I guess you would say, that we'd like to solve with using the Maps API in our pages is that the JavaScript maps don't always print very well. If I switch back to the static, wizard, static map wizard for a moment, uh, let's make a marker on some more polylines again. So when I try to print this map, it's not going to look very good. Okay. So, at, at the top here we have the print preview of the JavaScript API map. You can see that we've lost the shadow of the marker, and also the marker has now got a white rectangular background rather than the nice cutout background it formerly had. So it's, it's um, covering up part of the word mountain view there. Um, the polyline's completely gone because browsers aren't so good at rendering that. Um, your mileage may vary in different browsers, but I haven't seen a browser yet where printing just works. And we can compare that to the, uh, to the printing of the Static Maps API map, which of course, since it's just an image tag, browsers can easily print that. So what we really want to do, when it comes to printing our site, we want to switch out the JavaScript map and show a static map instead. Now, one way to do this, and it's, it's the way that we do it on maps.google.com, is we present a little print link. See this little print link here? Um, if you click through here, you get a customizable print page. So here we have, what you have here is essentially a static map. And that will print very well. But if the user just presses file print, then there's no way that in JavaScript, across all browsers, you can intercept that event that the user is trying to print the page and switch out to a better looking page. Um, so instead what we want to do, it's not enough to just have a print link because users will sometimes press file print and that won't look very good. We want printing to just work by default when we press file print. So the way that we do that is with a little bit of CSS magic, if you like. Here we have the HTML of that page which combines the Static Maps API with the JavaScript API. I'm particularly focusing on one div here called map container, which is going to contain the map. Um, this is, it contains three DOM elements. The first DOM element is called load map. It shows a static map image that is the first thing you see when you load the page. Um, you'll notice that we're setting a, we're setting a style as it index particularly. The first DOM element there has Z index 20, and then 10, and then 0. So these are appearing in front of each other. And each of them have been absolutely positioned so that they are actually lying on top of each other rather than underneath each other. So the first thing we see when we load the page is this static loading map. The second thing underneath that is a div in which we'll load the JavaScript API and present a JavaScript map. So this is the interactive map. It takes a while longer to load but it's much more compelling for users. And finally, underneath both of those, we have yet another static map image, which, is, which we call print map. So what we do with this print map is every time we update the JavaScript map in some way, say the user pans or zooms, or they add or remove a marker or a polyline, we're going to recompute the, um, the URL for the equivalent static map image and update the source tag of that print map. So you might imagine that um, constantly updating the source of your image is going to cause us to fetch, um, fetch the same image many times from a Google server and maybe get you flagged as, as, a, as, a, um, as a scraper, which would be really bad, or maybe just clag the user's um, internet connection. So it'll be really, really slow. So it's generally fairly bad. So the way we get around that 
is we have set a class on each of these elements. The first two elements have set class GM no print, and the third has class GM no screen. Um, these are CSS classes which are defined by the JavaScript API. So when we load the API into the page, these classes are actually inserted into the, into the style of the page. Um, GM no print means that these first two DOM elements are only visible on the screen, and in print mode they are invisible. Whereas the GM no screen means the opposite. It means that this DOM element does not display on the screen, but only when you print the page. So what we've done is whenever we drag or, or otherwise change the JavaScript API map, we've updated the source of, a, of an image, which is hidden normally, but appears only when you print. So when we go to print the page, let's go to print the page. When we print the page, what we see is a static map image which is equivalent to that JavaScript image and looks exactly the same and prints well. And so this will also keep track as I zoom and so on. Okay. So what we've done there is we've made printing just work in the Maps API for, sorry, for sites which are using the Maps API. And we've also shown how we can hide the latency of loading the JavaScript API by showing a static map image in, in the foreground while loading up the API in the background. One thing I would, would like to mention is I'm not the first to actually think of this trick. The trick of showing a static map image in front of the JavaScript API map is actually due to um, two other sites, blog.leap.ch and nearby.org.uk. Uh, I think we're the first here to discuss using state maps for printing as well, but um, that's, that's only as far as I know. I'm sure someone else might have thought of that. So, for the second part of my talk, I'll be talking about Street View and the Maps API. This was only added fairly recently in March, so I'm presuming that many, of the pe many people in the room may not have played with this yet. Um, Street View is a really cool feature of Google Maps, which allows you to view panoramic imagery for various sites, currently only in the US, but coming to other countries at some point in the future. For example, we can look up our location here, Moscone West. Hide the info window. We can zoom in a little bit. Whoops. I'll just zoom in a bit there. Mm -hmm. Oh, we landed on Moscone West already. So we can look at any site where one of the Google Street View cars has driven past and taken photographs. So this is the front entrance that we all, all came in this morning. Um, a few things to notice. If you turn off Street View and turn on Street View, there's these blue lines here. This is a tile set that we've generated which shows for what streets we have panoramic imagery data. So this is great for giving um, users feedback on where they can actually view data. Let's look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Another thing to note is that we can follow these navigational links inside the panorama and essentially follow the way that the car drove along the road. Um, if we do come to an intersection, then we're presented with several possibilities to branch out. So essentially you can imagine there's a large road graph. Here's an intersection. There's a large graph which shows for each panorama where are its neighbours and how to get around the city. Um, and one last thing to note is that the panorama that you're seeing here is actually a flash widget which is being wrapped inside some JavaScript to be embedded in the Maps page. So as far as Street View and the Maps API goes, there are three main classes that we're interested in. The first of these is G Street View Panorama, which is just a JavaScript wrapper class around that flash widget that lets you view the Street View panoramic imagery. It supports... Um, several methods, of course. You can show it and hide it. You can retarget it, by which I mean you can move it between divs in the same page. You can interrogate and set the point of view. That's the POV. So you can cause it to zoom in or zoom out. And um, if you call set point of view, you jump to a new view, whereas if you call pan to, you instead smoothly pan across. So generally, I would recommend using pan to because it looks much nicer. The second class that we're interested in here is the G Street View Client class. This is a bit like the GClient geocoder class, which you might have used for geocoding. Um, the GStreetView client class sends a query to a Google server and calls your function when it finds out the answer. So in particular, it supports two methods. Um, get nearest panorama, 
accepts a latitude and longitude and it returns back to you the location and some metadata about the nearest panorama we have for that, image, uh, for that position. rather. So if you were to ask for the, uh, if you were to ask, get nearest panorama for a particular latitude and longitude, you'd get back a, a latitude and longitude that is nearby plus some descriptive data about that point. And the second method on that class is get panorama, panorama by ID. When you know the ID of a, of a panorama that you want to look at, you can jump straight to it rather than having to ask for one that is nearby a particular latitude or longitude. <coughs> the third and final class is the G Street View Overlay class. And this is a very simple customization of the G Tile Layer Overlay interface class. It lets you add a new tile layer to the map. So we don't force you, for example, to show that blue tile layer overlay in the Maps API. Instead, you're free to show it and not show it via the G Street View Overlay class. So I'm going to build up a simple example which demonstrates how to use all of this. So here's part one of the example. I'm showing on this page only two div elements. The first div contains the JavaScript Maps API map, which is, of course, interactive and so on. And the second div contains the G Street View Panorama object. That's the Flash Viewer. So we can interact with that as well in the usual way. Now, I'm going to use two event listeners in this code. The first event listener looks to see if the marker has been dragged around. So if I were to drag the marker to a new location, the panorama will update accordingly. Likewise, I have an event listener on the panorama to know when it has moved around. So these navigational arrows allow us to move the panorama along the street. And I've got a listener, an event listener, on the panorama for this event, which is moving the marker accordingly as I as I follow intersections and so on. Let's take a look at the code. So I've broken up this up into two, pa uh, two slides, this code. Um, the code which drives the application is on the first page, and the code which handles the events is on the next page. <coughs> so at the start, we declare four global variables, map, pano, street view client, and camera. The map is simply an instance of the GMAP2 class. It renders our JavaScript map, and we can interact with it. You can see that on the first line of the initialize function. Uh, the second line of the initialize function initializes the pano object, which is an instance of the G Street View Panorama class. We construct a G Street View Panorama in the same way as we construct a GMAP2. We pass it a div, which the API will take care of rendering the contents into. And thirdly, we initialize a, a Street View client. This is much like the gclient geocoder class for, uh, for geocoding addresses, except that rather than taking an address and returning a lat long, it takes a lat long and tells us where is the nearest panoramic imagery for that point. The next two paragraphs of the code are, are pretty much Maps API boilerplate. We make a camera, uh, a camera icon, rather. We place it on the map. We set its latitude and longitude. And on the map, we also uh, center it on the camera initially and we add a, um, a small map control so we can pan around and zoom and so on. But the last three lines are quite interesting. These show two event listeners that I mentioned earlier while talking through the demo and a call to the Street View client. So the first event listener is listening for the event drag end on the camera. So when you drag that camera icon around, we're going to fire an event which we catch here and we call a function which is on the next slide called on camera move. Likewise, we also listen to the panorama to find out when it has moved. Now, its function, uh, its event name, rather, is initialized. The initialized event in the panorama means that it has just moved and it has rendered the scene and is now ready to be interacted with. So this is what happens when you press those navigational arrows inside of that street view panorama, that flash widget. And finally, we have um, a request to, essentially, to kick off the whole page. We query the street view client to find the nearest pan panorama to our initial camera position. So we didn't, um, to pick the camera position there, I simply geocoded the address of the Moscone Center and typed this in here. So that's not actually the same position as the nearest panorama looking at that area. So we have a query at the start of our code which asks Google where is the nearest panorama to the Moscone Center so that we can look at it. So on the next slide, we see the event handlers. The first of these is on panel move. This is called whenever the user uses the navigational click arrows to move around inside that flash widget. 
What it does is simply um, interrogate the location that the panorama has moved to and move the camera accordingly. So as you, as you move around inside the panorama, the camera icon on the map moves around as well to follow it. When the camera is moved, that is on the end of a drag or after the panorama has been clicked on, then we call on camera move and we ask it to find the nearest location for that camera for which we have panoramic imagery. So then the camera will actually snap to that location on the map. I didn't show that earlier, so let me go and do that now. If I do pick up the map and place the marker somewhere where there is not data, you can see it snaps to the nearest point for which we have imagery, which is typically the nearest road. And that's using the G Street View uh, client object. Finally, the workhorse of this code is the onPano data function. This is the function which is called whenever we hear back from Google about the location of a nearby panorama. The pano data object there is a chunk of JSON which includes a number of fields. Um, here we're using .code and .location and .lat long. But it includes a lot of metadata about the panorama. Um, copyrights for where we obtain that imagery. Um, usually that's Google, but occasionally not. Um, as well as copyrights, it also has um, the locations of nearby panoramas so that we can programmatically wander around the streets and a bunch of other data like that. So here, we first check the code to see if we did find some G Street View imagery. If we didn't find any, then the code won't be 200, but usually 600, which indicates that uh, a query had no, re no result. So for example, if I drag this marker into the middle of a city block, then you can see that I get the query, uh, the code 600, because there was no data there. Uh, presuming that we do get data, then we update the position of the camera, uh, the camera marker, I mean to say, and then we change the pano to look at the new location. So this causes the bottom div there to update with some new panoramic imagery. Okay, so that's the end of my first, the first part of my example. So let's extend it now. In the second part, I'm going to simply add one new marker to the page. We call this marker the target and the camera is always going to pan to look at it. As I move the target around, the camera will pan to keep it in sight. If I move it too far, the camera jumps to take a look at, jumps to find the nearest panorama to that object, to that target rather. Likewise, if I were to move the camera using the, um, the navigational arrows inside the panorama, you can see the camera updates and then angles to keep looking at the target. So it's constantly trying to keep the target in view. Let's take a look at the code. So here we're just extending the previous example I had. We have one new global object called target. And in the function initialize, we create that target, which is just a marker on the map. So we create the target, set an initial latitude and longitude for it, add it to the map. And the interesting, interesting part here is we add an event listener. When the target has been dragged, then we call a function on target move, which we define below. In the function on target move, we find out where is the new position of the target, where is the old position of the camera, and how far away are they? So if the target is too far away from the camera, then we figure that, well, we won't be able to see the target very well from where the camera is, so we should probably move the camera as well. So here I've just decided that if the target is more than 50 meters or 150 feet away from the camera, then I'll move the camera. Otherwise, I'll just update the angle of the camera to look at the target. So. Um, when the target is too far away from the camera, we call the function get nearest panorama again and ask Google where is the nearest panorama which can see the target. And Google will come back to us and tell us where it is and we'll move the camera accordingly. Um, otherwise, we, we call this function update angle, which I'll define on the next slide. Update angle simply figures out the angle between the camera position and the target position. So um, once it figures out that angle, it calls the panorama and asks it to pan to look at where the target has moved to. So it's pretty straightforward. As far as computing angles goes, um, there's some code here which you can look up on Wikipedia. But essentially what we're doing is figuring out the difference in latitude and the difference in longitude, accounting for any warping that the Mercator, projector, that Mercator projection gives and then looking in the right direction accordingly. So. For the third and final part of our example, we're going to add two new calls. Um, we add to the page two new 
uh, UI elements, you might say. One allows us to toggle the tile layer. That's the blue tile layer, which shows us where there's imagery available. And so, for example, if the user picks up the camera and places it on a street for which we don't have data, they may not be surprised when it turns out there's nothing to see there. Likewise, we also add a geocoding dialog. So um, the address of this conference is 747 Howard Street. We can go there, and the camera, the target will move to that exact geocode position, and the camera will move to the nearest panorama, which can see that data. See that position, I mean to say. So here's the code for that. Again, we're just extending the example that we've had so far. We had one new global object called the geocoder. This is an instance of the geoclient geocoder class, which I presume many of you are familiar with. This is the proxy object by which we can ask Google, um, here is an address, please give me the latitude and longitude for that. So the first function here is called toggle tile layer. It's called whenever that button is pressed to, to turn the tile layer on and off. If we haven't already got one, we create a new GStreetView overlay class, and we add this to the map. If it's not already on the map, if it is already visible, then we remove it from the map. So that's pretty straightforward code. Um, the second function there uh, is called whenever the user presses go on an address. So it takes the address, it makes a request for Google to get the uh, lat latitude and longitude which corresponds to that address, and it moves the map to look at that, plus it um, updates the position of the target accordingly. And then it updates, uh, sorry, then it calls Google to say, here is my lat latitude and longitude, please give me the nearest panorama for that, um, for that data. And so then we'll update the position of the camera to try and look at the target. So those were the three main classes in the Maps API to do with Street View. So I'd like to look at um, two examples before we wrap up. The first of these mashes up Street View in the Maps API with driving directions. And this is actually written by a Googler, Tor Mitchell, um, in his 20% time. It's a really neat demo. What it does is it lets you find a route between two positions. And I'll just use the defaults here. So we'll look, we'll geocode those positions and compute driving directions between them. And these turn up on the map by default. So we have here standard JavaScript map. On the right-hand side there, we have a uh, textual panel. That's been filled out by the G-Directions object in the Maps API. So not only do we provide you with the polyline to show how to get between places, we also provide you with, um, with directions in the language of your choice for how to get there, so textual directions. So this shows all the major steps along the way. And up the top here, we have an instance of the G Street View Panorama class. So we have a big panorama, so we can look around as we drive along. And what this demo does is it lets you drive along the demo uh, sorry, along the route automatically. So once every second or so, it steps forward to find the next panorama, which is along the same direction as the, um, as the driving directions polyline is going. Now, you can imagine how this would be useful. For example, you can stop partway along. Whoop, there's a bus in the way. Let's go one step further. You can stop partway along and look for local landmarks. So for example, there, there's a park over here. If we want to, we can zoom in to find out details about the park. OK, there's people wandering around, etc. On the other side of the street, we can see looks like a shop, perhaps, or a takeaway food place. So if we were hungry, we could go and eat there. As well as driving around, you can also leap ahead to, to new segments. Let's say we already knew the way to get to Clayton Street. Then we could jump ahead to Clayton Street and keep going from there. Um, one more thing to notice is we have this neat little progress bar that tells us how far along we are in a particular route um, making up the driving directions. So that's a pretty neat demo of the sort of thing you can do with Street View and directions, matching them up in the Maps API. Um, one final example is, in some sense, a real example where um, this is not not written by Google, but this is, of course, Trulia, a large real estate site in the US. And we can look up their listings for apartments in New York. Let's look at the first of these. So here they have, amongst other things on the page, they have lots of data. They have 
um, a street view panorama looking at that property. So if we were interested in buying some property, this would be a really neat way to find out what the local neighborhood looks like. It looks pretty nice. There seems to be some cafes, um, a subway, whoops, and even some sort of shop on the corner. It's taking a while to load. Um, notice when we first load that page that they didn't show the Street View tab by default. Rather, what they're doing there in the background while they load the page, they've made a query to Google for the address of this particular um, property. And they get back from Google their response saying, yes, we have data nearby, you can show a panorama. Otherwise, they don't show a panorama. So um, it's quite useful to use that G Street View client object to figure out where you should be presenting Street View data. Okay, so that's all I had to talk about today. Um, thanks very much. Um, we'll jump to questions in a moment, but first I actually have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, because of the slight delay this morning, lunch has been extended until 2.30 p.m., and it's located on level three after this. And don't forget to provide us some feedback on the, um, the forms, the cardboard forms you'll find under your seat, or on your seat. Thank you very much. Can you tell us a bit about what you use to render the images on a server side, and how do you deal with such a load for all the static images, especially in encouraging us to use it? Yeah, we're very happy for you to use it. Um, I don't think we have any concerns about load, really. Um, these images are actually, th one of the reasons we use Flash is it has very good graphics capabilities. And what we're actually doing here is loading up image tiles, much like the tiles in the Maps API for the map. So we load up tiles, which make up the scene. And if I, were to, if I clear, clear my browser tab, uh, clear my cache, rather, and reload that page, um, you can actually see them resolving as I pan around. At least on a load bandwidth connection, you can see that. Let's see if this works out. So if I pan quickly, oh, we have a very good, very good connection here, so you don't actually see. But as you pan around, you'll see that some chunks of the image are actually still blurry and get resolved later. So we're actually stitching them together in flash and um, warping them according to, this, to the um, projection that we're using. My question was more about the, the static images of the maps, especially with the you know additions of markers and polylines. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, again, I don't think we're too concerned about load there. Do you re-render everything? Do you have do you use DSPs to render everything? Do so, yeah, yeah, we're rendering this on the server side. Um, we re make requests to our own backend servers to get the tiles. We st stitch, stitch them together and then overlay anything you've requested, like markers and shadows and polylines. Um, this actually isn't too, too much load for us so far that we've found. One thing I should mention um, is that we do actually have a limit per user for how many static map Im images they can fetch per day. Um, this isn't actually too, we're not too concerned about uh, load so much as the potential for scrapers to steal the data from our data providers. So if, if an end user, um, essentially per IP address, if a single IP address is fetching more than 1,000 unique static images every day, then we get concerned about that and we'll shut them down. But th um, that's only unique images, so it's not really a concern if you show the same image every time on your site. And um, yeah, I'd be really surprised if you bump into that, but we'd certainly lo love to hear back if people are hitting the quotas. Okay, thanks. So is that the reason why you guys never let uh, the browser cache any of those tiles? I don't, I don't know, that may be a dumb question, but I've always wondered, like... Why Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Can you speak um, to the mic? Why don't they just let it cache the tiles. That might be like totally dumb, but like caching the map tiles? Ha Sorry, was that about caching the static maps or about the map tiles? The map tiles in the JavaScript API, is that? Yeah. Right, so um, we do cache the map tiles in the JavaScript API. Um, let me see if I can pull one up. So we do cache the map tiles. Um, they're loading very quickly for me here, but if you panned around on the slow connection, you'd see them come in. Um, so if you look at a region, then go away and then come back, they'll still be in the browser's cache, they'll, they'll load up very quickly. We try to use stable URLs for all of our map tiles, so that if another user behind the same proxy has seen some map tiles recently, we'll, just go, we'll go to the proxy and get the image from there, not all the way back to Google. Now, that's not so much because we're concerned about load to Google, but just because we're concerned about latency to users. We want users to be able to see these map tiles as fast as possible.
The previous demo talked about caching um, technology. Is it leveraging from that same technology the, regarding the demo that you're showing us, or is it a completely different functionality? Right. So in the Maplets talk, um, particularly the gadgets part of Maplets, the gadgets API gives you a, a number of useful functions which let you cache images, um, script, uh, HTML, XML, and so on. Now, the reason for that is that typically a user who writes a gadget will write it once, um, write it, uh, let's say, they'll, they'll develop it against their own single server, and their server can't withstand too much load, but then they'll put it on Google.com, and it might be wildly popular. And so, rather than getting just one or two queries that they got while they were testing it, they'll suddenly get thousands of queries, and that often takes down their servers. So we added those, added those proxying functions so they could fetch images via Google and fetch their XML and the JavaScript and so on via Google so that, <coughs> so that they're not hammering the server. And then Google takes care of um, regularly polling the server to see if there's a fresh version of their script or a fresh version of their images or their data and serving that up to users. So essentially that's just to help out developers who are writing gadgets but don't have the same sort of resources Google does on the server side. Is it um, possible, or have you thought about um, making it uh, possible to retrieve static images from the, st from the panoramas? Sorry, to, to what, sorry? Uh, to tr tr retrieve static images of the panoramas, so like outside of Flash to somehow retrieve those tiles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly technically possible that we could statically stitch together those panoramic images. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't be able to pan around, which is one of the benefits of that Flash player, mm -hmm. but that could be good for printing, for example. Um, I think I've seen, hmm. no, I'm not sure if I've seen an example of that. But I'm, you can actually do it yourself if you find out the images that we are using for Street View. Oh, really? You can get the actual URLs to the tiles? In yeah, the yeah, you can certainly look them up. And um, if you were keen, you could write your own stitcher. But perhaps in future, that's something we'll add to the Static Maps API. Or like an ability to view the panorama images without the, um, the overlay of the intersection lines and arrows and and such? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know if, I mean, the, let's say the navigational links, for example, mm -hmm. um, if you were rendering a static panorama, they're not so useful because you can't actually jump around right. if it was just an image. Mm -hmm. So I suppose we'd leave them off in much the same way as we don't show the controls when you're rendering the static maps API. All right, thank you. So if you had your own uh, flash panoramas, could you integrate these those into this application? Sorry, can you repeat your question? I can't quite hear you. Say you had your own panoramas that you wanted to integrate into this. Is that possible? Um, I, there's, a, there's some bad booming. I'm sorry. If you got your own images, your own panorama that's in Flash, could you integrate that into this application? You can't at least yet. So this is much like, I would say, custom map tiles in the Maps API. Uh, the question was, if you have your own panoramic imagery, can you put it inside of Street View? You can't yet. Um, it's certainly an, an interesting idea that we'd like to look at in future. Can you use the street view if you're behind a firewall? So, can you use street view if you're behind a firewall? Uh, essentially, no, unless your firewall allows you to, to make requests from google.com. If, if you can configure your firewall so you can make those requests, then yes, you can use street view. Not sure if you can answer this one, but uh, will it ever be possible to put markers inside the Street View panorama with the Flash API that's coming out now? You can add markers and polylines and such to maps. Um, thinking it would be very interesting if you could add those kinds of custom uh, things to the Street View panoramas themselves. Uh huh. It's certainly something we've thought about. We think it would be really cool. That's just more a matter of prioritization, I guess you'd say. So I, I won't commit to a deadline, but it, it sounds interesting, yes. Okay, so if there's any further questions, I'll be hanging around out the front after the talk. I'd be happy to take any questions then. Thank you.